Okay, it's 5.02. Uh, why don't we get started? I'll keep letting people in as they, as they arrive. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Michael Bellicosa, Community Engagement Manager at the Wilton Library. A uh, couple of quick housekeeping items. Keep your uh, mics off during the program, as well as your cameras. Uh, there will be a Q&A period after the presentation, and you will use the Zoom chat in order to submit any questions or comments. Now, in order for that to work smoothly, when you go to the chat function, send the question or the comment to Max Gabrielson. And you'll see when you go to chat, first thing you'll see is to everyone. You click the little down arrow and change the everyone to Max Gabrielson because Max is the moderator and he will take care of the questions at the end. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Elaine Tyloria, the director of the Wilton Library, and we'll get started with the program. Oh. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first program in this year's scholarly lecture series. For 14 years, Wilton Library and the Wilton Historical Society have partnered to present programs that expand and enhance our knowledge of Connecticut's rich and diverse history. The theme of this year's lecture series is Connecticut Creativity, Vision plus Imagination plus Inspiration. And one might say we'll learn of the results of that combination of talents. I would like to thank our friends and supporters for your kind donations that help us to offer these programs. Thanks in advance for your online donation to this series. Our very special thanks to Nancy and Bill Brodigan for being the sponsors for this evening's program. It is now my pleasure to introduce and turn things over to our moderator, Max Gabrielson. Thank you, Elaine. Welcome everyone. It is my great honor this afternoon to serve as moderator and to introduce our speaker, the first speaker in our series, Gil Harrell earned his doctoral degree at Brandeis University. He is a musicologist and music theorist whose interests include styles ranging from Western classical repertoire to jazz. Previously, he has served on the faculty at CUNY Baruch College, where he was awarded the prestigious Presidential Excellence Award for Distinguished Teaching, as well as the Southwestern University of Finance and Economics in Chengdu, China. Currently, he teaches at Naugatuck Valley Community College, where he has thrice been presented with the Merit Award for Exemplary Service to the college. Most recently, he was honored with the prestigious Connecticut Board of Regents Teaching Award. At Naugatuck Valley Community College, Dr. Harrell conducts the college chorale a cappella ensemble, teaches music history and theory, and serves as musical director of theater productions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gil Harrell and his lecture today, Charles Ives and the American Music Identity. Gil. Thank you so much, Max, for that introduction. And thank you to the Wilton Library for hosting this program. It's always a pleasure to get to talk about material which may be a little bit more on the esoteric side. That is to say, repertoire which may not be as familiar as the staples of the Western canon. Charles Ives is not exactly a household name, and I would suggest that even audience members who are familiar with Ives in general sense may not be familiar with the works I'm going to discuss tonight, or at least not all of them. Now, Max uh, gave the title of tonight's program, which is Charles Ives and the American Musical Identity. And this is something we're gonna circle back to several points during tonight's lecture. The emphasis on Charles Ives, not just as a great composer, not just as a celebrated composer of the modern period, who is now more or less accepted in all circles, not just in academia, but in the concert sphere and elsewhere as one of the great composers of the early 20th century. But we're also gonna talk about Ives as an important figure in the development and the creation of a distinctly American sound. So we'll begin with that. If one were to travel back in the time machine to the 19th century and ask around and say, well, who are the great composers of today? One would almost certainly receive exclusively European names in response. And indeed, if we think about the 19th century, 
This was the heyday of composers such as Beethoven and later on Schubert and Schumann and Mendelssohn and Wagner and Brahms. And later in the century, Bruckner and Mahler and Puccini and Verdi and many others whose names we're omitting from this list. Yet there are no American names on that list. In fact, if one were to crack open a textbook of American music history, uh, one would find that the composers in that book would be largely omitted from a general music history survey course. In other words, if you were to go to a college campus and take a Music 101 course, you would probably not study any American composers who were operating and composing in the 19th century. That doesn't mean there weren't any, of course. Names that come to mind would include Stephen Foster, whose music Charles Ives was intimately acquainted with. And you can find other names as well. However, none on the order, the scope, and the magnitude of the creativity, and the contribution, and the lasting legacy of Charles Ives. I would suggest that Ives, therefore, might be considered in some way to be one of the most important composers in American history. Now, some of you are no doubt thinking, well, what about Aaron Copland or Leonard Bernstein or Stephen Sondheim? And those names are all important in the canon of American music. But recall, Copland was born in 1900, Bernstein was born in 1918, and Sondheim was born in the early 1930s. Therefore, Charles Ives, who was born in 1874, predates all of them by a significant margin, in fact. Uh, and um, I would suggest that, again, if we were to open up that standard college music history textbook, what I sometimes call the Music 101 textbook, it wouldn't really matter who the publisher is. My guess is that irrespective of the publisher or the edition, the first American composer you would come across, a chapter on American music, would come at the end of the textbook and it would almost certainly be Charles Ives. And I can speak from experience having worked on some of these textbooks and edited McGraw-Hill's uh, 12th edition of their music appreciation textbook that that was in fact the case with that particular text and I've worked with other textbooks where the same holds true. So the importance of Ives cannot be overstated in the context of his contributions to the American musical soundscape. Today we'll see exactly how he accomplished this feat, but I want to say a few more words about this before we move on. Recall that in the early days of the American call it the establishment of the American pedagogical systems and concert systems, that is to say the establishment of the great orchestras, some of which are over 100 years old and still operating today. That would include, for example, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, the BSO, which stretches into the 19th century. So they've been around for well over a century at this point. Um, we have to consider the fact that in the 19th century and certainly in the late 18th century when America was founded, the opportunities to study music in a serious way and to pursue a career as a composer would have been few and far between. So what I said earlier about the dearth uh, of American composers in the textbook, uh, really that has to do to some degree with a lack of infrastructure, lack of conservatories and, and famous orchestras and pedagogues and the like. And that's gonna change to some degree as Charles Ives is, is coming up and making his way through the, uh, his education system, he learned much from his father. We'll talk about George Ives during the program, but he also studied at Yale in the late 19th century at a time when there were very celebrated musicians on the faculty of that institution, specifically Horatio Parker. Again, another name that folks will perhaps not be familiar with, but in the uh, period, that is to say in the late 19th and early 20th century, Parker was an important composer who contributed much to the repertoire, specifically in the realm of opera, I would suggest his operas and oratorios are probably his best known works. But if you weren't writing a dissertation on American music of this period, you might not come across his name at all, or if you did, it might just be a footnote. However, Ives is going to surpass his teacher in that way, and Charles Ives will accomplish things that Horatio Parker and others in that period never did. The interesting thing is that Ives never really got to experience the fame, fortune, adulation, and esteem that comes with these kinds of contributions and accomplishments, at least not early in his life. So many of you already know this, but we should address the elephant in the room, which is that Charles Ives, the celebrated composer, was not a composer by vocation. He was a composer by avocation. Some might say by hobby, although I don't think that quite hits the mark. A hobby suggests that it's something that someone does casually, Charles Ives did compose casually, but he did so with such erudition, with such wit and training and imaginative creativity 
that uh, again, it cannot be overstated. However, to address that elephant in the room, we should say that Charles Ives did not compose music for a living. In fact, he sold insurance for a living. Now this is important because it's going to afford him the opportunity during his life to compose music as he heard it, as he felt it. These are abstract concepts. What does that mean as a composer hears and feels things? Well, when we talk about a composer writing music, often what it comes down to is composer hearing sounds that are coalescing in their brain and making their way through the conduit of the arm, out the hand through the quill, as it were, in the days of Mozart and Beethoven, uh, nowadays through the computer keyboard, and certainly in Ives' day uh, with a pen or more likely a pencil in hand. So what does that mean? Well, think about it this way. If you weren't worried about pleasing a publisher or an audience that's paying for tickets to go see your work perform, you would have a great deal more latitude and creative freedom to compose music as you heard it. And again, this idea of hearing music in the inner ear, this is not something that's exclusively appropriate when describing Charles Ives' creative process. Uh, we could use this. Mozart was famous for creating music uh, in unlikely scenarios. Many of you who have read Mozart's biographies or his um, his letters, for example, which have been translated, know that um, one of his favorite places to compose music was in his billiards room. Billiards as in shooting pool. Um, and this is actually uh, something that's captured in a couple of scenes in the movie Amadeus. So well, hats off to the producers and the director of that, that film for including that little detail. Um, but the idea that a composer is to some degree beholden to an audience and to critics uh, this is something that did not apply to Charles Ives, and therefore much of the music that we're going to listen to tonight, some of which has been described as experimental, um, it contextualizes, or I should say it gives context to his music um, when we understand that he was an insurance salesman, and, and I might add a very prosperous and later on a very wealthy insurance salesman who didn't have to worry about pleasing audiences with his music, didn't have to worry about selling tickets, um, and could write music and later revise it according to his own impulses as an artist rather than having more practical and commercial interests in mind. And by the way, uh, those limitations, if we can think of them as limitations, something that applied to most composers, uh, and that includes Mozart and includes Beethoven. Uh, it wasn't really until the 19th century and really into the late 19th century that composers developed the spirit of uh, maverick-like independence and autonomy to compose music as they saw fit. Certainly when we get to the modern period, Charles Ives is not alone in composing music that, well, perhaps would not appeal to the average listener. There's a famous story about Aaron Copland coming back from his studies in France in the 1920s. And when he returned from his studies with Nadia Boulanger and others, he was asked, Aaron, what did you learn over in Paris? And he said, I learned that they're scaring everyone out of the concert halls. Well, what he meant by that, of course, was that music of the early 20th century, what we call the modern period, and incidentally, we still use that phrase, that term, the modern period. Sometimes this vexes students who wonder why music, which is over 100 years old, could possibly be considered modern. But when we talk about modernism, remember what we're alluding to here, what the term suggests is that this is music, which evinces stylistic traits that boldly reject and radically break from the past. In other words, Renaissance music might sound somewhat like late medieval music and early Baroque music might have quite a bit in common with late Renaissance music and so on, Baroque music and classical music and classical and romantic. But when we get to the late romantic period, sometimes it's hard to hear the connections between composers like Wagner and Debussy and the works of Arnold Schoenberg and Igor Stravinsky and to a certain degree, Charles Ives. So uh, some of the things that make this true uh, in include certain things that we'll talk about which are important to discuss in the context of Ives' music. So I'll mention those and then we'll do some listening. I've got a number of pieces prepared for us tonight. We might get to three or perhaps four of them. And I've tried to choose a kind of a, a representative hodgepodge, a potpourri of works that represent Ives' accomplishments in different genres. So we'll start with an organ work. We'll then look at a song from the World War I era, 1914, it was written. We'll then look at his towering, hellishly difficult 
and uh, an amazingly compelling sonata number two for the piano, better known as the Concord Sonata. And then if we have time, we'll end the program uh, this evening, either with a look at his quarter tone music or perhaps by looking at his orchestral tone poems and specifically a collection of three tone poems known as Three Places in New England. So, all right, here are some of the stylistic elements we're going to encounter tonight. Number one, atonality, or at least extremely heavy chromaticism. Atonality is, of course, the absence of tonality. And what that means is that rather than a piece being in C major or D minor or F minor, it won't be in any key at all. In fact, it will eschew or reject the whole notion of a key. What that means for a listener is that the music might be tough to kind of swallow and digest. In other words, it's a, some people sometimes say that, oh, the music doesn't have a melody, but that, that's of course completely false. You can have atonal melodies. Some atonal melodies are, are absolutely gorgeous. I think if you look at Alban Berg's 1935 opera, Lulu, it is filled with atonal melodies that are infectious in the way that the best melodies are. The same can be said of much of Ives' music. However, atonality for the average listener, if they're not rooted to a key, if you're not hearing C major or F major or D minor or D flat major, um, then you will feel sort of afloat, adrift. And um, it may be difficult to kind of connect to the music. So atonality is something that does come up in Ives' music. It's not the only thing that, that typifies or, or um, flavors his music. Sometimes Ives gives us straightforward tonality or what we sometimes call diatonic tonality. Um, other times, I think this is especially interesting, and we'll look at an example of this early in the program, we'll see examples of what is called bitonality or polytonality. Of course, if you know your Greek uh, prefixes, you'll know that polytonality means many tonalities. And that suggests that the music will simultaneously exist in two or more keys. And this sort of thing was happening quite a bit in the early 20th century. You can hear a very salient example when the curtain comes up on the dancers in Stravinsky's 1913 masterpiece, The Rite of Spring, the Sacre du Printemps. And in that, the first chord that we hear is a polytonal chord or a, a bitonal chord really of F flat major and E flat seven simultaneously. We get things like that in Ives as well. And in fact, we're gonna look at his organ work. Um, it's a, a work for solo organ called Variations on America. Some of you will recognize the tune as My Country, Tis of Thee. And uh, what you'll notice when we uh, get to the interlude between the second and third variations there, is that Ives writes something completely unusual in the score. In fact, some of you who read music would, might look at it and think that there was some sort of editorial mistake because when we'll look at it, um, he writes the different hands and the foot pedals in different keys. Uh, this of course creates a, a very, for musicians of that period, a very new and steep challenge. Today, of course, musicians who specialize in the reading of modern music will be familiar with it, so. Atonality, polytonality, bitonality, these are things we will encounter in Ives' music. Ives is also famous for at least two or three other musical, uh, we'll call them uh, flavors or ideas, which are very prominent in his music. We talked about uh, the, his approach to tonality. Now let's talk about his approach to rhythm. Ives' approach to rhythm might be described as occasionally chaotic, uh, very nuanced, sophisticated certainly, uh, extremely, exceedingly complex at times. Let me give you some examples of how that might work. In Ives' Fourth Symphony, he has two conductors conducting the same ensemble whose members are split into different groups, of course, following the two conductors, and they have entirely different tempi and time signatures to follow. Now, just imagine that for a minute. Imagine a far simpler scenario. If you were asked to sing Happy Birthday, Imagine that the person next to you was also asked to sing happy birthday. Now imagine that the two of you have to sing it at the same time, but in different keys, at different tempos, and in different time signatures. Well, obviously that's a, a tall order, even for a very seasoned veteran musician today. Um, but for Ives, this sort of thing comes up quite a bit in the music. And I mentioned just one example in the Fourth Symphony. There are many others like that. Other things that we might encounter in eyes, I think this is perhaps one of the most charming uh, musical attributes that you'll find in his music is the idea of quotation or paraphrase. 
What that means is just what it sounds like. Ives is known for this collage-like approach to music where he will suffuse an existing piece that he's writing with quotations, little snippets and snatches and fragments of pre-existing tunes, which he of course did not write. Let me give you an example. In Three Places in New England, which is a series of three orchestral tone poems, the middle movement is called Putnam's Camp, Reading, Connecticut. Putnam here referring to General Israel Putnam, the Revolutionary War, uh, Union General who uh, famously escaped capture by the British by riding his horse down a flight of steps. Um, and that, by the way, that image is captured in a very iconic statue in Putnam Park, uh, Putnam Memorial Park in Reading, just uh, a stone's throw up Route 7 from Wilton. Uh, I can't imagine it takes more than 15 or 20 minutes to get there from the library. So uh, for those of you who haven't been there, which includes me, by the way, I was talking to Michael before the program, I have not been there. Um, I am uh, gonna go check it out when the weather is, is nicer. So anyway, Putnam's Camp, Reading, Connecticut, um, the second movement. And what, if you listen very closely to it, uh, you can find snatches and snippets and fragments of many, many tunes that uh, come from a variety of sources. Some might be church hymns, some might be uh, military band songs, some might be what we sometimes call traditional music, things like Yankee Doodle Dandy and For He's a Jolly Good Fellow, traditional American tunes that go back to the Revolutionary War period or perhaps even predate that period as Yankee Doodle Dandy does. Uh, it was first fitted to lyrics in the middle of the 18th century, but the tune is thought by musicologists to stretch back into uh, the 16th century. So there you have it. Um, these are some things that you might encounter in Ives. And Ives had extensive experience working with, for example, church hymns. He was a church organist, even as a teenager, uh, he must have been a virtuoso. Now we, we can't say that for sure because we don't have many recordings Ives was famously averse to recording himself um, and he died in 1954. So the recording technology certainly existed. Um, however, this was just not something that he pursued with any great alacrity. Nonetheless, we can posit from the evidence that does exist that Ives was even as a teenager, a young virtuoso and um, the organ piece, which we'll listen to momentarily, which he played as a youngster, uh, still vexes professional organists today. It's a very difficult piece. And I've, uh, his quote when he was asked about it was, that piece is as fun to play as baseball. And, um, you know, he wasn't being glib or, or otherwise, uh, you know, making a, a, a snarky comment. He meant it. I've loved baseball. And in fact, when he was a youth, he was so good at it that uh, his coach said, you know, if he didn't love music so darn much, uh, he would have been a great ball player. Uh, he could have gone on to be a great ball player. He was the captain of his team in high school and, and uh, so on and so forth. So this is just a, a very well-rounded young man growing up in Danbury, Connecticut, later educated at Yale and New Haven. Um, not just a brilliant musician, but also um, a, an athletic and a very sort of active, physically active uh, young man. All right, let's take a look at his organ piece. And this is again, Charles Ives' Variations on America. Now the tune that is called here, America, is better known, I think, to audience members here tonight as My Country, Tis of Thee. Those of you who know it will know that it's written in a triple meter if you count one, two, three, one, two, and three, one, two, three, one, two, and three, one, two, three, one. Uh, I mentioned, this particular aspect of the music, because one of the most obvious things eyes will do with it, besides turning it into a bitonal, uh, in, in one interlude is, is in a bitonal key realm that exists between F major and D flat major at the same exact time, he's also going to mess with the rhythm quite a bit. Now, here's the trick. If it was just dissonance and chaos, nobody would be interested, right? The, the question is, how can you breathe new life into what is essentially a very simple tune and keep the piece recognizable, even when some of those more chaotic elements are swirling and coalescing in the front of the stage, so to speak. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at the score. I'm gonna go ahead and share that score for you. And some of you may think, well, Gil, I don't read music. Um, therefore, you know, maybe it's not helpful to look at the score, but actually, 
uh, even if you don't read music, it's enormously helpful to look at the score. And the reason is you have to think of it this way. Musical notation is the language of musicians. It was the way Charles Ives communicated his ideas to the world. So even if you don't understand exactly what's going on, and I would suggest that there are many music majors who would have trouble following this score, um, what you can follow instead would be the contour of the lines, the up and the down, and that sort of thing. Even if you don't follow that, you can just look at what we're uh, beholding, uh, 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 feasting our eyes on right now. Behold what's, what's happening in this interlude section. Now, I mentioned it earlier, but what this means is that the right hand of the organ is playing in F major, and the left hand and the foot pedals are playing in D flat major. Let me play a little bit of that and see if you can follow the tune. You can see it here, F, F, G, E, F, G, A, A, B flat, A, G, F. So there's the tune, plain as day. Um, let's see if we can make sense of it and fish it out of this incredibly uh, dissonant polytonal texture that, um, that Ives is weaving. This is perhaps a, a strange way to start our listening experience, but I think it tells us quite a bit about Ives. He's very young when he writes this, he's a teenager. And what it suggests to me is that A, he's got an incredibly sophisticated sense of musical humor, and B, he's really interested in this idea of combining separate keys simultaneously. I'm gonna to go to a different video so we can actually see what some of this sounds like. I realize I didn't play the beginning. If you wanna know what that sounds like, we can go by back and listen to a little bit of it. Here's the most straightforward presentation. Virgil Fox, of course, here on the organ. And you can see the organ, a fiendishly difficult instrument to play. It involves uh, playing several manuals, typically three, but sometimes more. And um, the keyboards, again, are called manuals from the Latin word meaning of the hand. You also see these knobs on the side. These are stops. When an organist wants to unleash the full power of the instrument, he or she will pull out all the knobs or, as we might say, pull out, well, all the stops. Let's go ahead and listen to the first introduction of the theme, and then we'll listen to a very fun variation that comes towards the end. I'll pause it there. Clearly we see here that the young Charles Ives, teenager though he might have been, we know he was able to play this work and what we just watched is not especially difficult to play, certainly not for a, a competent organist. However, it's ample evidence, it gives us evidence that Ives, when he wanted to write straightforward diatonic tonal music, he certainly could. Um, this work is in the form of a theme and variations like Beethoven's Diabelli variations or Bach's Goldberg variations or Mozart's variations on Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. The idea of writing variations on a simple tune is a, a, a very hallowed tradition in music that goes back centuries. 
Um, so Ives is really building on something that exists, but notice what he's doing here. He's, he's creating variations on what is distinctly an American tune. So we talked at the beginning of the program, how did Ives forge this distinctly American sound? A lot of it has to do with his, his choice of thematic material. Um, one of my favorite moments here is towards the end, we get a variation where it goes into F minor into 4-4 four, four time and almost what might be described as a, a Latin rhythm, what sounds like a rumba almost. And um, it's, uh, it's clearly the same tune, but it's transformed here. Listen to this and think of uh, a teenager writing this. One cannot deny, the, again, the infectious quality of Ives' writing here. It's clearly the tune. I think anybody would recognize that, right? And yet, we hear that things are fundamentally different. He's put it in a minor key, so he's put it in the parallel minor, which will give it a perhaps more tragic and dolorous sound. But he also puts it in this very upbeat uh, rhythm with the uh, left hand specifically, playing these upbeat syncopated figures that punctuate the melody. Uh, and meanwhile, the pedals played with the feet, of course, are chugging along and providing a foundation for the harmony. It's very clever. It's very imaginative. And again, it fundamentally changes the tune, but still maintains the integrity and the recognizability of that tune. And I think for anybody who's writing a theme and variations, to some degree, this is one of the primary objectives. All right. Speaking of infectious melodies, we're now going to look at another Ives uh, well, he didn't actually write the melody. It's based on, a, on an old uh, war tune called, um, the tune he, he called it, He Is There, and he interprets, he reinterprets it, and rewrites the lyrics here and harmonizes the melody as um, a sort of something to champion the Yankees, the soldiers who were gone over in World War I when Ives was writing it to fight against the Kaiser, that is to say, to fight against Germany in the First World War. So the tune is called He Is There. It's written here for a baritone and piano, but there's also a part that Ives writes, which is un, uh, unusual and atypical for the leader genre. And that is he writes for a, a kind of a piccolo type instrument, like a fife that he wants playing along with the piano and um, sort of in counterpoint at times with the singer. I wanna say a few things about this genre because it may not, for many listeners, even those who are familiar with Ives, you may not know this about it, but he was a prolific and, and a really darn good songwriter. And the idea of writing songs, or I'll use the term art song, the term in German is lead or plural leader, goes back to the, probably you could, most musicologists would date it to the early 19th century. Beethoven wrote a wonderful collection of songs, An die Ferne Geliebte, To the Distant Beloved. Schubert wrote his Winterreise collection, An die Schöne Müllerin. Uh, Robert Schumann would write collections of songs, including the Dichterliebe, Frauen lieben und leben, um, Merten, others. Um, we could go through. Brahms was a prolific songwriter. Even Chopin wrote songs, by the way. They're very interesting. They're in Polish, if you're wondering. So this idea of writing songs is a very romantic idea. And I want to emphasize this point because I don't think Charles Ives gets enough credit as a songwriter. And I don't think he gets enough credit as a sort of a a post-romanticist. Often what you'll see is people emphasize, and I've seen this in the textbooks and I've argued with, uh, with editors and other uh, academicians against this, that Ives is considered purely a modernist. And it's true, he's got 10 toes in the modern period, but he's got at least one uh, dipping into that romantic period. And so much of what Ives wrote, because of some of those more uh, salient elements that I discussed earlier, the polytonality, the, um, the simultaneous presentation of different time signatures, the quarter tones, which we haven't gotten to. Um, because of this, the, the call it the more radical side of Ives' music, the more modernistic, the more avant-garde is emphasized. But uh, when he wanted to, Ives could write songs 
in the tradition of a 19th century lead. Now this particular song is not written in the style of a 19th century lead. Uh, however, um, if you want to investigate Ives' songs, you, you certainly can. And in fact, he wrote them not just in English, but he set famous German poets to music, including Goethe and Heine. So um, Ives was a prolific songwriter. It's just not what he's best known for. People know the symphonies and, and his um, piano works, including the Concord Sonata, which we'll get to. Uh, many people uh, neglect, or I wouldn't say disregard, but perhaps it's just not on their radar. Uh, so hopefully we'll stir some interest in Ives' songwriting tonight. Here is this great song written again in the era of World War I. It's called He Is There. And this is um, written for baritone and piano with a, a sort of a piccolo solo that comes in towards the end. Uh, you can see that this one is tonal. It's in B flat major. Of course, it starts on a diminished seventh chord. So uh, it takes us a while to get there. But... Um, this gives us an opportunity to talk about one of Ives' other uh, salient attributes, which is his affinity for military music and marching music in general. Now, this was a very fertile time, the, that is to say the late 19th and early 20th century for marching music. Many of you are familiar with the works of John Philip Sousa, for example, with which Ives was almost certainly acquainted with many of those works. But uh, in this case, Ives' affinity for military music really has much to do with his upbringing. And I mentioned his father earlier, George Ives, who was a military band conductor and conducted other bands. And he was uh, known for being, that is to say, the father was known for being an especially effective pedagogue who favored unusual pedagogical practices. For example, when he trained his son, Charles, and his brother Moss, uh, Moss Ives, they were trained to sing polytonal scales. So for example, the father would play something in C major and say, okay, now sing it in B flat at the same time. That's very difficult to do, folks. If you're trying to sing dissonances on purpose in parallel, uh, this is something that's exceptionally difficult. But if you think about it, as with learning a language or anything else, the sponge-like capacity of a young human mind to absorb complex and esoteric ideas is unparalleled. And so Ives' uh, embrace of polytonality is directly linked to his father. And Ives himself wrote extensively about this, how he would hang out in Danbury near the town square and he would listen to his father's band marching towards the town square. Maybe there'd be another band marching in a different direction. And so he would get this effect of different pieces played simultaneously in different keys at different tempi. And on top of that, he would even get a kind of a, what we would maybe think of as a Doppler effect of the music sort of going off in one direction and therefore the pitch is being affected by the directionality or the traveling nature of those sound sources. So um, this flavors a lot of his music. In this tune, even though it's written just for piano, we really feel the marching quality of it. It has to do with this um pop, um pop, um pop rhythm that alternates between the bass and the treble registers. Um, notice the words here, which are were obviously um, very suited for the time, that is to say 1914, when America um, you know, is on the, uh, the, the precipice of getting into this, this war against, um, against the, the German Empire at the time, uh, the Hohenzollerns uh, to be specific. And um, you'll, you'll notice that uh, there are, there's language in this which is very reflective of the zeitgeist of the early 20th century. So here is, he is there, Charles Ives, one of his many art songs, or again, the term in German is Lied or Lieder, plural. Um, and this is a great example. Fifteen years ago today, a little Yankee, little Yankee boy, march beside his granddaddy in the decoration day parade. Fighting for the right, but when 
there's something very infectious. Uh, I mean, keep coming back to that word, of course, but what I mean by it is, of course, if you listen to this, this is what we sometimes call a Velcro tune, or the Germans call it an Ohrwurm. Ohrwurm means an earworm. In other words, it's a tune that burrows in your ear and won't get out. And I would suggest that if you listen to this song, um, you'll certainly have it in your ear at least for a time. Now, the text, as I mentioned, reflects the zeitgeist of the early 20th century and of specifically the, uh, the conflict of World War I, but there's references to even older phenomena. For example, the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, uh, which was a, a sort of a Civil War veterans society. And um, it, that's referenced um, the Flanders Front. We don't talk about Flanders very often these days. And if I ask my students, where is Flanders? Uh, my sense is that maybe those who are familiar with, with Renaissance music would know about Flemish music. Uh, but for the most part, these are terms that are rather archaic in today's parlance. And yet, uh, when you listen to this music between the march-like rhythm on the piano, the fife that's brought in to augment the melody sung by the, uh, by the baritone and the text, it has this tremendous ability to transport one back. And we keep coming and circling around this question, what makes Isa's music distinctly American sounding? Well, we've seen two examples now where this is the case, and we're gonna see maybe one or two more before we end tonight's program. So in Variations on America or My Country Tis of Thee, we saw a very imaginative uh, uh, creation uh, of um, variations and interludes based on the tune My Country Tis of Thee, uh, written for a solo organist. Here we have a song that's in the tradition of the 19th century lead or art song. And um, we're gonna look at two more examples. So let's talk now about Ives' Concord Sonata, his Sonata Number no. Two. Now, this is a tough work and again, when talking about Ives, it would be doing a disservice to the audience not to include some of his more avant-garde music. But I should also preface this next section by saying that remember with anything that's avant-garde, that is more on the arcane side with atonality and some of the other more um, abstract features we discussed, remember that it's not gonna be like the song we just listened to. That is to say, you may not get it, quote unquote, the first time you listen to it, but these are works that really benefit from subsequent hearings and studying. So it's called the Concord Sonata. And once again, this piece is reflective of Ives' profound interest in um, not just in America, but specifically in New England in his, is what he would have considered his home. And that includes Connecticut, of course, but it also includes Massachusetts. There are a number of pieces that Ives wrote that somehow relate to the state of Massachusetts. And I think for Ives, as for, uh, for many who identified as staunch patriots, and Ives was, was certainly that, uh, whatever else we might say about him, uh, Massachusetts was sort of in many ways the birthplace of the revolution and therefore a very important historical geographical location. And um, many of his works allude to or refer to or conjure up images and tableaus associated with various uh, places and, and um, moments in Massachusetts history. This next one, the Concord Sonata, anyone who's been up to Concord, Massachusetts will no doubt have visited Walden Pond. And I can tell you that as a graduate student at Brandeis, I spent many years at Walden, uh, many uh, summers that is, so all through graduate school, six years, I would go over to Walden Pond in the summer I had a I would buy a, a season pass and uh, one could not help but feel the sense of tranquility and, um, and uh, quiet serenity that envelops this area. And, and you have to give it to the town of Concord for maintaining that despite the increasing modernization in the area. But there are all sorts of rules in Walden Pond, for example, no building in a certain radius around the, the, uh, the lake itself. Um, there's no, uh, no motorized craft allowed on the lake with the exception of course of, of rescue services uh, in, in case they need to. So it's a very tranquil spot to, to uh, sit, sit and contemplate. And of course that's what it's known for, right? Um, Ives wrote this because the town of Concord in Massachusetts in the middle of the 19th century was home to some of the most celebrated thinkers and writers of that period. Just to give you some names, we've got Emerson, uh, Hawthorne, Nathaniel Hawthorne we'll talk about uh, because we're gonna look at the second movement which is named after him, the Alcott's in the third movement. And of course the fourth movement, perhaps uh, the, the name that's best associated with Walden Pond specifically, um, Henry David Thoreau. So 
Um, Ives writes a programmatic piano sonata, and programmatic here means that it's instrumental music that's meant to convey a story or otherwise evoke a series of images or general affects that might be appropriate for conjuring up uh, the specific idea, or in this case, people being mentioned. I'm sure um, those of you who are familiar with this period of history and familiar with some of the figures I just mentioned will um, have certain expectations. And I think that's a welcome thing. When a composer writes programmatic music, to some degree, uh, they are inviting the audience member to uh, embrace the challenge of listening to the music and asking themselves whether the music lines up with what they imagine to represent uh, or they imagine would be representative of that idea. Let me give you some examples of program music in the 19th century leading up to this. Uh, I think one could make the case that Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, the Pastoral Symphony, was a very early example of, of um, romantic style program music. Hector Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique would be another example of program music. In other words, there's no, there's no singing, there's no lyrics that would be an opera or an oratorio. Um, this is a little bit more ambitious because Ives does not have full orchestra to evoke um, images and, and ideas through the use of that, that the manifold colors and instrumental timbres available. He's simply using a piano. And this sonata is fiendishly difficult. Um, it is written without bar lines, so there's no measures, there's no time signatures, and therefore counting is very difficult. Let me show you what the score looks like and then we'll, we'll go on and listen to the second movement. I'll show you the score from the first movement, which is again named after Ralph Waldo Emerson. Now imagine trying to learn something like this. Even for a, a very competent pianist, this would be an exceptionally difficult piece to learn. It is supremely dissonant in this opening stretch. And I, I don't wanna scare anyone away from Ives' music, but since we listen to uh, He Is There, the, the song that is more or less straightforward and diatonic in B-flat major. Now we'll listen to something on the other side of the tonal spectrum, just to say it's not tonal at all. In fact, it's very atonal. We start on B and then we fork out in what we call contrary motion with the right hand moving up and the left hand moving down. But if we tried to add up these notes and create recognizable sonorities, we wouldn't be able to. Uh, the notes simply uh, put will not make a whole lot of sense uh, to someone trying to analyze this in a tonal way. Just look at this first stretch here. We've got B, then we have, well, what would that be? A sharp against A natural and then against A flat? How could that be possible? How can you have three versions of A on top of each other? Well, that's exactly what Ives is doing here. This is a very experimental piece. We're gonna listen to a little bit with this, with um, without the score. We're gonna look at the uh, second movement. And one of the things Ives asks for in the second movement, if you notice, there is this uh, piece of wood inside the piano. Now, are you, you may be wondering, is this a prepared piano piece? Is he gonna lay that on the strings inside to um, coax out the sort of clip timbre that comes with this sort of idea? Well, no, John Cage is probably best associated with putting things inside the piano, ping pong balls and paper clips. And then we call that prepared piano, but that's not what's happening here. Rather, what the pianist is asked to do is to use this stick, this piece of wood, to depress keys, to create what are called clusters. Clusters meaning many neighboring notes sounded simultaneously. Some of you may wonder, well, isn't a cluster, is that going to sound good? And the answer is, well, remember that good is, is completely subjective. It will sound exceedingly dissonant. Anytime we play neighboring notes uh, simultaneously, it will sound dissonant. However, it does give the pianist something very novel for this time, um, a way to create and evoke a new sound, which perhaps uh, had never been thought of by anybody up until this point. Um, there are so many stories about the Concord Sonata. Um, would that we had more time, I would share some, but I'll just share one that involves uh, the pianist John Kirkpatrick, who apparently found a score in the 1930s in Paris on, on a colleague's piano and sat down and started playing it and, and recognized that there was tremendous genius in it. And he wrote to Ives and said, hey, can I have my own score? And Ives immediately sent him a copy and while he was in Europe. And Kirkpatrick came back to the States 
and became uh, one of the great champions of Charles Ives' music, and in fact gave the world premiere of this piece at a concert, I think it was either in Stanford or in Koskov, in, in Greenwich that is. So um, we're talking about creativity in Connecticut. This is written by a, a nutmegger, by a Connecticut composer, Charles Ives, but it's also, um, it, it has a, a very rich performance history in the state of Connecticut. So here is the second of four movements. Um, in many ways, the Concord Sonata follows the sort of the architectural template of the traditional sonata. It has four movements. Uh, those four movements are differentiated by tempo and what we might call affect or feel. Uh, not by key, certainly, because there are no keys in the Concord Sonata, not the way we use that word typically. Um, but it has all of these avant-garde elements, the lack of measures, the lack of concrete um, rhythmic subdivisions in the, uh, in the meter, and of course this block of wood which will be used by the pianist. So that's the end of the Emerson movement. Now we move on to the Hawthorne movement, Nathaniel Hawthorne, of course, the author of the Scarlet Letter. Pause it there, not because I don't want to listen to more, I certainly do, and I think many of you probably want to check it out as well. This is a very long sonata, about 45 minutes in typical performance. To give you some context, that's about as long as piano sonatas go. Um, Beethoven Hammer Clavier is about 45 minutes in duration, uh, but most sonatas are, are uh, quite a bit shorter, sometimes half that long or even shorter than that. Mozart's, for example, clock in between 15 and 18 minutes on average. So this is a real bugbear of a piece. It's exceedingly difficult. It's also exceptionally long. And uh, one wonders what Heinrich Steinweg, that's of course the founder of Steinway and Sons, would have thought about his precious Steinway instruments being played with a block of wood. If you're wondering, by the way, Ives gives very specific directions about how that block of wood should be used and how long it should be. If you're wondering, it's something like 37 centimeters, I think 15 inches or just under 15 inches. So um, it's very specific. For a piece that doesn't have bar lines, that's a very specific indication to give. 
All right, one more piece and we'll wrap up in about seven or eight minutes and then we'll have time for some Q and A. All right, we've looked at an organ work, we've looked at a song, now we've looked at a solo piano work, but we haven't looked at any of Ives' chamber works or orchestral works. So the next piece we're gonna look at is um, a work that blurs the line between orchestra and chamber music. It is performed with a conductor by necessity, as we've said, Ives' music, owing to its rhythmic intricacy and complexity, really requires somebody who can shepherd the uh, various disparate and wayward uh, directions that the orchestra is asked to pursue simultaneously. So this next collection of works is called Three Places in New England. I mentioned it earlier, but let me just say a few words about it. This is in the style of what is sometimes called a tone poem or an orchestral poem, or sometimes, um, uh, you know, these pieces are associated with composers like Richard Strauss or Claude Debussy. Debussy's Prelude to the Afternoon of Fawn is a great example of a tone poem. Um, Strauss's Allo Also Sprach Zarathustra um, is another example of a tone poem. Sometimes these are called symphonic poems, by the way. So the work we're about to look at is very much in the style of this late romantic uh, tone poem idea. Of course, it doesn't sound anything like Strauss or Debussy, uh, and we'll see why in just a moment. I think, by the way, you could make the case that there are parts of the Concord Sonata, which we just listened to, which are intensely romantic and impressionistic and not uh, you know, exclusively modern or avant-garde, but more in the, you know, something that, that uh, looks and nods its head to the past. However, um, in this next collection of works, we're going to see something that is a combination of, um, it reflects a combination of Ives' interests, namely the polytonality and the uh, poly uh, synchronicity, which we talked about, that is to say the different time signatures. Um, but it also uses that quotation technique that I talked about, the collage technique of presenting fragments of pre-existing tunes. Here you'll, you're going to hear, if you listen closely, um, tunes like Hail Columbia and From Greenland's Icy Mountains and, and um, Yankee Doodle Dandy and, and things of that nature. And if you blink, you miss it, because what I might do is he might just give you a, a fraction, just a little half a measure of a melody. Uh, it might be Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. You know, he quotes that all over the Concord Sonata. He quotes Beethoven's Hammerklavier. And one of the objectives, I think, for Ives scholars and biographers has been to um, dive deeply into his works and try to find all of these quotations, rather like a Where's Waldo, um, trying to find something that is hidden in what looks like a homogenous texture. Um, you find these, these little fragments which when you uh, break them down slowly and emphasize them and bring them out, you can clearly tell that Ives is quoting something here. And again, this goes back to his upbringing. Imagine him in Danbury listening to those different marching bands playing simultaneously. And the idea that the aggregate sum of what he was hearing formed some kind of composite. And that might mean that it was in different keys at different tempos and different time signatures and playing totally different tunes at the same time. We won't listen to it today, but if for those who want to check out Ives' Fourth Symphony, um, what he does in the first movement is he has the chorale, that there's an actual chorus singing, and they're singing a hymn. It's a, an epiphany hymn called Watchmen Tell Us of the Night. And they're in a different key, a key signature that is a different key and a different time, and it's brilliant and it's wonderful and it's, it is chaotic, um, but it works. And I think the same could be said of the three places in New England. Now we're not gonna look at movements one or three. The reason is because those deal with Massachusetts. Um, the, um, the first movement deals with the, uh, it's, it's a sort of an homage to um, Colonel uh, Shaw and the, uh, the all black regiment that served in the Civil War. And this is, um, I, I visited it when I was living in the Boston area. I wanna see it's on the, it's Beacon Street and Park Street maybe? Anyway, this is, um, that's the first movement. The third movement is called the Housatonic at Stockbridge. And this is a sort of a pastoral evocation of the Housatonic River in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, which is on the other side of the state, closer to Albany certainly than it is to Boston. But it's the second movement that interests uh, me uh, as an as a adopted nutmegger. I've been in Connecticut now for almost six years. So, um, you know, this is um, Putnam's camp in Reading, Connecticut, just a stone's throw up the road from the lovely town of Wilton. And what Ives is gonna do here, remember it's a program uh, piece, so he's gonna have program notes. 
And uh, we'll just listen to a short um, fragment of this piece. But what he does is he presents um, us with this idea of a celebration of the 4th of July in the town square. And so you've got this idea of a military band. So you hear snare drums and cymbals and other percussion instruments from a, a percussion battery that we would hear in a marching band, for example. And we'll hear brass and winds playing tunes that might be associated with the 4th of July. You'll hear, for example, a polytonal rendition of Yankee Doodle Dandy that lasts about a measure and a half. Um, and then it becomes this sleepy, dreamy piece in the middle, and then it explodes in fireworks at the end. And um, I think for many listeners, this is one of the things that makes Charles Ives' music so compelling, uh, so enchanting, so lovable, is his ability to bring us back to very specific places and moments in American history. And I, I think that this is true, not just of Americans. I, I know that there are some ensembles in Europe that uh, have embraced Charles Ives' music, especially in the last um, 20 or 30 years. And the, in fact, the group we're gonna watch right now is a Parisian ensemble. Um, so these are Europeans, presumably, who are playing Ives' music. And one wonders uh, if the music is as enchanting or perhaps even more because for them it would, it would evoke a, a very distinctive soundscape, which they wouldn't find in the European tradition. This doesn't sound like anything written by a European composer. It sounds distinctly American. And maybe that's one of Charles Ives' most important contributions to the repertoire. Here is the second movement of Three Places in New England, titled Putnam's Camp, Reading, Connecticut. Did you hear that little flute lick there? I'm just gonna rewind it about 10 seconds. Listen for the flute and you'll hear what is a Revolutionary War era melody that would have been played on a fife uh, on the battlefields of the Revolutionary War. Were you able to hear that? I'm gonna rewind it just a little bit. Listen for Yankee Doodle. And every time a fragment of the phrase is played, uh, it changes keys. So that's that polytonal aspect. This is a kind of a horizontal polytonality rather than a vertical one. This is a good moment to pause. Now, when I was preparing some notes for tonight's program, I actually went and I got a hold of the score for this piece and I went through it and traced through the orchestral lines looking for different melodies that I recognize. The truth is, um, I don't, you know, I'm, I didn't grow up listening to Presbyterian hymns in the early uh, 20th century. So many of these, I had to look them up, but some of the tunes that you recognize would include the British Grenadiers, Marching Through Georgia, 
Um, there are Civil War era tunes, The Battle Cry of Freedom, Yankee Doodle, Columbia, Gem of the Ocean. In fact, at the moment where the, the fireworks come at the end of the movement, you'll even hear a fragment of all things. And this tickled me because this I did recognize. Um, it, it's not a, a, immediately obvious when you listen to it, but when you see it in the score, it's very obvious. Um, he even quotes, of all things, uh, the ride of the Valkyries. Uh, of course, uh, from, from Wagner's second opera in the Ring Cycle. So the collage effect here is front and center is very powerful. And I think for many listeners, extremely charming. And uh, I hope you found this program charming and you'll be more inclined to check out the music of Charles Ives. If you're looking for a great Ives biography, you can't go wrong with Jan Swafford's biography of Ives. Uh, it's a strong recommend for me. And I don't know that the library has it, but... Um, but I would suspect they might. I mean, maybe it's, you know, again, as we said at the top of the program, Ives is not a household name in the way that Beethoven and Brahms uh, or even Wagner are. Uh, so therefore, um, I don't know, it might, might be uh, tough to find, but hopefully uh, you'll get your hands on it if you're interested in learning more about Ives' music. And, and if there's one thing you want to listen to, which we didn't get a chance to listen to tonight, check out the Ives Fourth Symphony. Uh, I don't think a single person on this call will be disappointed if you listen to Ives' Fourth Symphony. It's a masterpiece, I think, by any uh, metric, by any way we would possibly measure such a thing. Uh, and it's an incredibly um, vibrant testament to this incredibly talented composer who chose to uh, make a, a life for himself as an insurance salesman and, uh, and therefore uh, to write uh, music as, as he heard it and as he felt it. And uh, I think that's a very good thing because um, had he been forced to somehow uh, acclimate to the, uh, to the wishes and desires of an early 20th century audience, it's, it's possible and conceivable that he might have gone in a different direction. Um, but what we get here, for better or worse, is authentic Ives. And uh, as an authentically American composer of American sounding music, I can't think of anybody uh, who is more important in the canon. So, um, so thank you, folks. Uh, that was this was a lot of fun, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Gil. That was a truly dazzling lecture, really remarkable. And I know that I speak for everyone in the audience when I tell you how much we appreciated this really, really um, in-depth look at Charles Ives and his extraordinary contributions. You have such a a, a marvelous command of the. The, the whole field of music. And I, I was struck by so many of the things that you talked about, the vocabulary of music in particular, uh, polysynchronicity. I teach a course in, uh, at Wilton High School in, in classical Greek, and we do spend some time looking at um, English words derived from Greek. So poly, polysynchronicity is my new favorite <laughs> uh, on, on top of polytonality and so many others. It's really wonderful. Um, I, I do have a question here uh, from, from one of our attendees, and I'll share it with you. You mentioned that Ives did not like to record very much, and also that he didn't really need any music income. But did he generate revenues from his music, either by performing or by publishing his works? Publishing, yes. Performing, no. Uh, and, and by the way, Max, to your earlier point about, about the, uh, the particular parlance of music, I would suggest, Max, there are probably many music majors across the country who would also be struggling with these words because unless you're talking about specifically this kind of music from the early 20th century and Ives in particular, these are not words you'd come across. You could study everything Beethoven wrote and, and nary a polysynchronicity to encounter. Um, so thank you for saying that. Now to, uh, to the question, uh, Ives did uh, generate some income later in his life through the, the sale of his, his manuscripts and his music um, his music, by the way, he left all of it to the Danbury Historical Society, Museum and Historical Society. So it, like the Ives House, um, is, um, is part of the fabric of that town's identity, certainly in, when it comes to the arts. Um, so he wasn't really interested in making money uh, through music. However, later on, he would have um, works performed by some of the top orchestras in the country, for example, uh, and he worked with some of the top uh, musicians of, of this period. People like Elliot Carter, for example, was a great champion of Ives' work starting in the late 1930s. Uh, Leonard Bernstein, Aaron Copeland, these were all people who recognized the, um, the, the greatness of Ives. 
in a period of history where, you know, again, Ives died in 54. So he didn't really get to see, um, to, he didn't live to see what his, his legacy would become, I guess is what I'm trying to say here. And as a performer, uh, his aversion to, um, to performing in public and recording has vexed biographers. He never gave any indication of why he didn't want to, to play. Um, in fact, we know, as I said earlier, that he was likely a virtuoso who played, if he could play the Concord Sonata, <laughs> And what couldn't he play, right? We know that, that music is exceedingly, exceedingly challenging, demanding. Um, but you know what? He's not alone in this field. And I would suggest that if we look to history, we would find another composer pianist about a hundred years before Ives, who was similarly gifted, a wizard at the piano, and yet gave fewer than a dozen public recitals in his entire life. Now his entire life did not last very long because he was born in 1810 and died in 1849. I'm talking about Frederick Chopin. Chopin did not like performing in public. He simply did it. He had an aversion to it. He played in salons and other intimate environments in Paris. And even that he wasn't fond of. So in that case, he's sort of the, the diametric opposite of Franz Liszt, who was such an enterprising, uh, traveling virtuoso who showcased his talents and, um, and, and made a lot of money doing it. Um, Chopin rejected that idea and so did Ives. I should also point out something which I didn't mention during the program, which is that Ives, after the 1920s, wrote almost nothing. Now he went back and he arranged and he edited and he prepared for publication certain pre-existing works. But for the last three decades of his life, the man didn't write a thing. And that too, uh, you know, there are figures in history who, uh, who check that box. For example, the great Finnish composer, Jean Sibelius. Sibelius, whose real name, by the way, was Jan. He took the name Jean because he had an uncle who had made a career in Paris and uh, thought that Jean sounded so much more elegant than Jan. But nonetheless, Jean Sibelius, uh, you know, he wrote his violin concerto in 1904 and he would write some works after that. And again, we have a period of nearly three decades where he didn't write a single thing. The story with Ives is that apparently he came downstairs with a tear in his eye and said to his wife, nothing sounds right and he can't write anymore. And he never did. So um, I guess uh, to, to tie it all together, um, by the times Ives was on the map, on people's radar, he was kind of retired as a musician. He wasn't doing any writing anymore. Uh, so he did some playing, but, uh, but no writing anymore. And again, that's by the 1920s, it's very early. I'd like to ask you another question that our, one of our attendees has presented uh, from Virginia Gunther. How was his music accepted by audiences and by other musicians? Great question. Well, you know, this is something that uh, Swafford, the biographer I mentioned, spends a lot of time talking about, which I appreciate because remember the Aaron Copland quote I cited earlier, where Copland claimed that European composers were chasing audiences out of the concert halls. He was referring to Stravinsky and Alban Berg and Anton Webern and Arnold Schoenberg and the atonal musicians, for example, of the Zweite Wiener Schule, the second Viennese school. But Ives' music, it really depends. For example, his fourth symphony uh, was received a triumphant, a delirious reception. Um, but one can imagine that some of the more abstract pieces, for example, his works for quarter tone pianos, we know that those you know, were, were not popular when they were premiered. And um, people are not acclimated to listening to quarter tone music. And what that means, by the way, for those wondering, is that in Western music, for the last nearly 1,000 years, we divide the octave into 12 notes, especially in the last 500 years. And really, since the 18th century, it's been the gospel. That has been the golden standard, the 12 tone system. Ives wrote works for quarter tone piano. Um, in fact, two pianos tuned a quarter tone apart, and those pieces did not uh, enchant the audiences the way he might have hoped they, they would. And the reason was because people just could not wrap their ears around music written in this microtonal system. By the way, there have been composers who have attempted since Ives to utilize microtones, and uh, it has largely been unsuccessful. However, um, there is a young musician, he is in his 20s now. He has been hailed as the savior of jazz by, by uh, Quincy Jones. His name is Jacob Collier. And one of the things he is famous for is utilizing microtones. So I think you could draw a dotted line from Ives to Collier. Now that's a very, very tenuous dotted line, but nonetheless, um, just to give you two examples. Uh, one, 
triumphantly successful, the Fourth Symphony, and two, the pieces for quarter tone pianos, which, which were not well received. Gil, I have another question from one of our uh, audience members, and that's simply, who wrote Over There? Oh, great question. This is something I'd have to look up. Um, you know, when we go back and we look at, I, I looked up Yankee Doodle uh, when I was preparing some notes for the program, and it was written by, uh, I don't even remember his name. I read it, you know, two days ago, but it was written by a British, um, I think he was a composer who was associated with a certain garrison in the Boston area who wrote it to mock the Yankees, to, to mock what, what the British would have thought of as, you know, Americans. Um, and uh, then after the Revolutionary War, it was sort of uh, newly appropriated to have a more patriotic and, and um, celebrative um, quality to it. So, uh, you know, these, some of these older tunes, you could go back and look up who wrote them. And I probably wouldn't recognize, I don't think anyone would recognize any of these names. Um, they are, uh, these are pieces that are woven into the fabric of our musical soundscape. Yet uh, the creators of these tunes uh, you know, sometimes are lost to history. It's a good question though. Um, another question, did I speak uh, languages other than his native English? Yeah, yeah, he, he was very good with German actually. I don't know how well he spoke it, but he could read it very well. And he set it to music in a way that suggests that he really understood what he was doing. And remember he studied at Yale, uh, obviously Yale, pretty good place to study, <laughs> even in the 1890s. And um, the faculty there, you know, there has been historically then and now a kind of Germanocentric approach to the study of music. And this is not necessarily because the faculty at various institutions have particular uh, leanings towards uh, Germany as a, as a cultural uh, location or, or anything like that, but simply because if one were to go through the pages of music history, the vast preponderance of uh, great uh, composers in the canon were German speakers. So I'm including Austrians there. And we could go through, it's a who's who, Bach, Handel, uh, into the classical period, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Schumann, Mendelssohn, uh, the list goes on, Brahms, Wagner, the list goes on and on. So um, Ives was, was very competent in German. And I would suspect that he probably had a smattering of French as well. Um, another question, can you tell us who uh, the composers were or are who have explicitly named Ives as a major influence on their music? Yeah, great question. Uh, Harry Parch is a fairly unknown composer, but he was profoundly influenced by Ives. Um, Aaron Copland, I mentioned, was influenced by Ives. You know, think about how Copland's music is so... Uh, much of it, not all of it, but much of it is, is sort of intertwined with the American identity. Think about pieces like Billy the Kid and Rodeo and uh, Fanfare for the Common Man. I mean, can you think of something that sounds more quintessentially American than Fanfare for the Common Man? Uh, or Rodeo for that matter, you know, in two completely different ways. So um, in that sense, you know, Aaron Copeland comes to mind. He's, you know, he gave many interviews about it and wrote about it. But uh, you just have to look at his works and how he embraces this idea of, you know, being a proud Yankee, so to speak, and writing about American themes. Um, Aaron Copeland absolutely comes to mind. Another question which I'd like to ask you is, uh, it's impossible to listen to your wonderful lecture without being reminded of jazz and of the, the long tradition of American jazz. Did, did Ives uh, influence jazz artists or was he in turn himself influenced by their own contributions? His, his life obviously intersected the, the growth of American jazz. Absolutely, you know, born in 1874, um, by the time he's, let's say in his forties, uh, you've already got the recording, the great recordings of the 1920s, which are really the first jazz recordings. We're talking Louis Armstrong and the, the Hot Five and the Hot Seven later in Chicago and New York. So I would have certainly known that music. And I would suggest that um, it's not as strong as a connection as you might think. It's not as overt as say Stravinsky's Ebony Concerto, um, which is you know, clearly indebted to the, to the world of jazz or some of the other composers like Leonard Bernstein who embraced jazz. Ives is just a little bit older than those. Remember, he's about 25 years older than Louis Armstrong. So th yeah. we think about it that way. And also remember that by the time jazz becomes uh, a thing that is traveling and making its way to some of these bigger cities, specifically New York, which would have been close to Ives' home, he stopped composing. He's hung up his boots at that point. 
So there isn't as much of a connection as one might think. However, I, I would suggest that you could make the argument that some of Ives' music, um, even though it might be coincidental, there are rhythmic patterns and syncopations, and incredibly, um, incredibly nuanced rhythms, which uh, are, are something that you might hear in jazz or in a cakewalk or a ragtime piece. So they overlap slightly, but not as much as you think. And again, a lot of that has to do with Ives' age, born in the 1870s. And the fact by the time he's in his 50s, he's given up composing right at the time when jazz is becoming a big deal in the North. Thank you. Well, Gil, I see that we are, uh, we've run out of questions on my chat, chat box. And I would love to just thank you again for this marvelous lecture today. Uh, you know, I, at one point you, you used the words compelling, enchanting, and lovable to describe the music of Charles Ives. And I know that we've all learned so much about this extraordinary artist and composer and, and his contributions uh, as a native nutmegger. It's been a wonderful experience to spend this afternoon with you. Thank you very much. The pleasure is all mine. And uh, to everyone on the call, thank you so much for joining us this evening to the Wilton Library. Thank you for making it possible. And uh, Max, I look forward to teaming up with you for the next one. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gil. Great program as, as usual. Well, my pleasure. Have a good night, folks. Okay, good night, everybody. See you in a couple of weeks for the next one.